Hey, what's up? My name is Ashley John Baptiste. I studied history as an undergraduate. I matriculated in 2008 and graduated 2011, and I'm currently a BBC News reporter, presenter, and speaker. That's a really cool resume. Thank you so much. Um, so we want to start at the beginning, as cringe as it might, may sound, and we want to talk about your journey to Cambridge. So any ideas that you have about the preconceptions that you had before coming, the type of school that you went to, all of that will be yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, I, first of all, I never really considered Cambridge as, I didn't think about university until I was about 16, 17. Like I wasn't reared for university. I grew up in care in South London. I lived with five different families or placements. So four foster families and a residential care home. Uh, and I, for a long time, um, was just dealing with the immediacy of being in the care system, you know, the trauma that comes with that. So I wasn't thinking about my future for a long time. Um, and I wasn't a perfect student. I wasn't a role model of any sort. I was very much a care experienced person who struggled to navigate mainstream functional spaces so school was a problem for me for a long time the school I went to was a state school in Bermondsey it wasn't a good school it wasn't a bad school I mean it most recently fell off state actually but back in the day it was just you know a state school in South London it certainly wasn't an Oxbridge type school um I got into Cambridge in 2008 and before me it was five years before me that someone had got into Oxford to do English so it wasn't an Oxford school it wasn't really a Russell Group school um, but I had potential I got invited to spend a week at Cambridge by the Sutton Trust for uh, for a summer school and that just blew my mind Rosemary Horrocks was doing a lot of the lectures she at the time was the Fitz History Director of Studies so she inspired me to apply to Fitz to study history I remember emailing her before applying, just being like, I've got a legacy of failure and mistakes and I'm definitely not the ideal candidate, but I do think that with a bit of help, I could, I could do it. And she was incredible and I hustled and I got into Cambridge. Um, that summer school did a lot to make me comfortable about the idea of being an undergraduate at Cambridge. I always had those perceptions of it being for upper middle class people, being white and all of that. And of course it was when I started, but as you guys will know, Fitz was just the perfect environment to ease me into the space of Cambridge. So that's, yeah, I suppose, I suppose that answers your question. No, that was amazing. And I love hearing about when there's, specific figures in people's journeys to Cambridge that have really been influential. So I actually went on a Sutton Trust program. So oh, wow. I remember just getting there and being like, wow, this place is yeah. amazing. And we were both on target. So oh, we have brilliant. similar experiences. Of Shout people. out. Yeah, Come on. Honestly, <laughs> 100%. And you touched on not being like a stereotypical ideal candidate or even a Cambridge student. So when you got to FITS so or you started studying at Cambridge, how, what was it like for you to adapt to the environment? Well, FITS made it easier, didn't you? You know, it's, it's a space that isn't as intense as other colleges from what, you know, what I understand. Um, it was still really hard, though. FITS is nothing like where I grew up like period it's just not like south london it's you know i you know i mean we're in a, a climate now where people are open to talk about race and class but the the added of being care experienced was just a whole nother level of different you know and difference so you know many would have called me the underclass i was a child of the state i was living in a council flat before i started at cambridge I was broke. I was really poor. Um, I really struggled to live in that council flat before starting. Uh, and so, and, and then when I started Cambridge, my foster parents who I had lived with before I moved into the council flat, they didn't want to take me to Cambridge. So I was truly isolated and that was really hard. And I remember matriculation, everybody's families came down. I, I think it was some sort of dinner. And I had no one, I had no parents and, it, you know, that was really embarrassing. 
and I remember feeling really, and whilst, you know, I didn't have the excuse of being an international student as to why I didn't have people to come down. I was just a care leaver. Uh, and so I carried a lot of that baggage. But do you know what? Weirdly, I was quite confident at the start. It was quite weird. I, I'd been to, I, I was at a state school that was um, very cosmopolitan. Class wasn't an issue. Poverty wasn't something that was a down on because there was a lot of poverty. Um, same with ethnicity. So I, I kind of didn't feel particularly odd. It was only halfway through my first year that I kind of realised that Cambridge was a, res- a reverse hierarchy and that actually, like, where where back at home, it was kind of cool to have come from a particular start or a tough start and it was, it was quite respected to overcome certain things. At Cambridge, it was respected to be wealthy and to be from the best school. And so that kind of reverse sense of what it meant to be liked and uh, accepted for me was really hard. And then I began to realize, wow, like I'm, this is a, t- the rules are totally different to what I knew. And so I kind of dipped halfway through my first year in terms of just my identity and my sense of self at fits. Um, and then I decided when I kind of wrestled with that, you know, we all go through that process where you, wrestle with your sense of self at Cambridge. I think most people do anyway. And when I got to that point, I decided I wanted to try and be true to who I was. And I remember I had, um, and also a lot of the black, a lot of the black students I met at Cambridge went to really good grammar schools or private schools. And so even their cultural backgrounds were different to mine because um, they were just more prepped for Cambridge than I was, you know? because of this, they went to really good schools. And there's that, you know, touches into class and all of that. So uh, I, I think I'm kind of answering your question, but I suppose what, what my, my top line is, is that um, whilst, yes, Fitz was great, and it definitely helped me, you know, transition to, you know, getting into Cambridge, still it was hard, and still I was a minority and still those nuances of being care experienced, being from South London, being black, all of that stuff, it, it, did, um, it did kind of present itself as a challenge. But then I have some of the best experiences, you know, like Cambridge was amazing for me. Um, I met incredible people. I, I think you asked me about um, some of the black students I met at the time. I, I mean, the, Af- the African Caribbean society was really important to me, especially in my second year. And I remember um, meeting a crew from St. Cats. There were a couple of... The year I was at Cambridge, uh, at the time I was at Cambridge, St. Cats had a big black cohort. And I found some good people there. And also at Phipps, a lot of good people at Phipps. And so, yeah, you know, you kind of go through this identity thing and you, you're working out who you are and you're... You know, I think I think a really interesting thing about Cambridge, at least for me, I thought to myself, if this is a microcosm of the working world, if this is a microcosm of how society works, I need to flourish here and I need to do what it takes to flourish. And so if you feel like you're struggling at Cambridge, you almost tell yourself, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to flourish in the real world. And I think that's such a lie. Like Cambridge is not like society. And I, I'm glad to say that I do think society is changing. And so it's okay to be in a white majority space and find that weird and, and, and feel like it's not for you. And you can still navigate that and, you know, flourish beyond Cambridge. I think that makes sense. Um, so Cambridge was great and yeah. I'm all the better for it. I am all the better because of Cambridge. It taught me a lot. Um, and yeah, I'm really grateful for my experience. Thank you. And when you did have those feelings of um, maybe feeling a bit isolated, when you decided to be more true to yourself while you were at Cambridge, were there any communities that really helped you with that? Were you part of any societies? Yeah. Um, you mentioned yeah. the ACE. What was your involvement? With that? Yeah, good question. So the what, despite the challenges, I said to myself, I am not going to be that student who exists on the periphery. I didn't want to be that kid who went to London every weekend and who was just, you know, I, I <laughs> are you those girls? <laughs> but I think for a few weeks, for a few weeks. no, that's, but that's fine. You've got, you, you, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do you. But I think for me, 
I think for me, I said to myself, this space has to become my space. I want to flourish here. I want to, I wanted to meet the poshest of the posh. Like I went, I didn't, the idea that a certain space would intimidate me or um, deter me in some way, I just thought, nah, like I've got, I've, I've really got to like, I've, I've got to navigate this space well. I don't just want to scrape a degree from these three years. Like I want an abundant experience. And I knew that if I went to London all the time, I wouldn't get that. So I wanted to meet the poshies of the posh. So in terms of society, like I was on the, is it the JCR? The student, I was on the student government. I was ACS officer with a mate of mine called Dave King. Um, and that was amazing. So as part of the JCR, um, and I did a lot of access work in FITS. It's like, I don't know if Paul Chirico is around or Sarah Owen, but those people will tell you that I was quite active in that. Um, and I remember, I don't know if you still have the Tompkins table, but um, I was very much of yeah. the view that the Tompkins table shouldn't determine the culture we create. Because I remember there was a big debate in terms of admissions. Should it just be about people who are going to put us at the top of the Tompkins table? Or do we want a more broad, rich culture? Is that more important in terms of you know, admissions. So we did a lot of work around that. Um, I was part of the African Caribbean Society. I loved the African Caribbean Society. It was just mates for me. It was just like, I met a whole load of mates who I'm still in contact with and they're just all doing so well. And you have that to look forward to. Like 10 years, you're going to be like, yo, he's doing this, she's doing that, they're doing that. This is amazing. Um, ACS was great. Uh, what else did I do? Um, I did a bit of sports, so I I tried to row. I was like a novice rower for a bit. The, oh, those those five a.m. starts. Oh, those like we would it's have a five lot. It's a lot, isn't it? And um, I didn't. I did it for like a couple of times. We did bumps, and then I was like, yeah, at least I tried something new. I wanted to try new things, you know. Um, and then I did a bit of athletics. I did a lot of music. So I was in a band. We did like all the May balls, all the garden parties. Um, yeah, it was a great time. I remember, but I think if you're asking the space that was like where I felt at my best, it was the ACS. It was just, I remember Jesse Jackson came to visit and he was coming to, to speak at the union. And my mate was ACS president. And um, the union, the, the guy who ran the union or who was the leader of the union, he am um, the president of the union. He, we, I went to him and I said, look, Jesse Jackson's one of the greatest civil rights leaders alive, one of the biggest figures for you know, black people. Um, can we get some time with him? And this uh, union leader said, no, um, he's come for union members. If you're not paying to be part of the union then you're not going to hear him speak and it was like you know like everyone was going to this debate and he was like he was just not making no space for jesse uh, to speak to acs people so i just said if you don't want like a hundred black people protesting outside the union when he's given his speech about equality and access then you better give us some time with him and then he's like okay yes 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 and um and what was the <laughs> all of a sudden this Oh yeah, I was like, I was like, we will make this an issue, man. Like, we will make this an issue. And then it so happened that before the union um, debate, he was he was coming to visit Fitz. Like, Fitz was the college that he'd come to visit, which was like, what? Um, sorry, have I cut off there? And um, and I was I was asked to host him. So from just trying to get into the room, I was now hosting Jesse Jackson at Fitz. So we had, I had like the whole afternoon to, to host him and we went to other parts of Cambridge as well. And then, um, and then before his talk at the ACS, we had, he literally, we had a room with the ACS and Jesse doing a Q and A for about half an hour. So we had all this, I had all this time with him. And, and then, so we, we did, I gave him the tour. We had the moment at the union and then we all got seats in the union and then after his talk, like, there were a bunch of 
black students in a corner just waiting as everyone was like trying to get pictures of him and all of this. And he just looked over at us and he said, y'all want to come back to my hotel? Like to have drinks at his bar? <laughs> and and we were like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then like he just spoke like about all this amazing stuff to do with civil rights history and everything else and less intense stuff. But I remember thinking only Cambridge. <laughs> Like, I was like, only yeah. Cambridge. And I was like, this is a moment. Like, this is a life moment. And so the ACS was incredible for moments like that. And, and, and Cambridge was just this space of, like, it was just this otherworldly experience where you'd have moments like, whoa, this is probably never going to happen again. And I think that's the beauty of Cambridge, that you really should embrace it because – actually as hard as it can be there are some really beautiful moments where you just realize um yeah how how privileged you are to be at that university i can say um that's like amazing and it just shows like that the initiative that you take definitely makes a huge difference in this place and it kind of reminds me of a conference that we now hold as part of acs which is called the motherland conference i don't know if you've heard of it before but it's amazing and we have probably similar figures to Jesse come in and we get to talk to them and it's actually in collaboration with the union so it just shows Amazing. like so far so yeah so that's the thing oh, I lovely. To add. <laughs> that's awesome um so speaking of that and speaking of activism and things um we wanted to hear about some of the main student campaigns at the time so you've talked about this little thing that you've had with the union, were there any other issues that affected black students at the time that you were at university? It's, 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 it's funny you call it activism because for me, I never saw it as that. It was just kind of common sense responses to nonsense. You know, like I, when I remember because my mate, he was ACS president, I was like, yo, like why are we... Why are we having this? Like, why are we just saying the union like talk to us like that? Like, are you like he would want to see us? Like, he is about inspiring the next generation of black people. <laughs> um, and so it's it was activism, but at the time for me it was just this offense at wrong, you know, at, at wrong behavior and wrong, wrong thinking. And I think it was actually me finding my voice. Like there were moments where um I would challenge something. And at the time, it just felt like me developing the backbone to challenge what I disagreed with. But it was activism. And I think that's just before I get into the answer, like that's what's beautiful about university, I think, broadly, is you begin to develop, you know, ideals that you want to represent and, and kind of fight for. And, and, and I think that's a really beautiful thing about universities, that you find your activism, you find your voice, you find what it is that you really care about. And yeah, so obviously for me, racial equity was up there. But also, um, again, being a voice and speaking up for care experienced people. So uh, I was access officer and a big part of what I did was trying to open up FIPS to care leavers and to, uh, you know, capable, competent care foster kids, basically, who... who could have the potential to go to, to Oxbridge. So I remember we did uh, like a weekend where they'll come visit. And then back in London during the holidays, I organized a conference and we got Cambridge to come down and lead part of the workshop. And so that was something I was really proud of just, um, you know, beyond just the issue of race, thinking about underserved groups in society. And of course, care experience people they are such a group um well i mean i mean that would have been enough to be fair <laughs> like alongside getting a degree but um yeah the race thing uh, and trying to just make room for care leavers and i know um that more care leavers have since got into fit so i do know that um speaking to sarah owen not too long ago so yeah um and and again like state school representation. And I know that FITS is leading the way in that, which is brilliant. 
and just little things like um, when I went to when I went to Cambridge, care, care leavers couldn't stay at the university all year round. They had to obviously go home during the term times. Uh, sorry, during the holidays. But actually, uh, some people don't have a home. You know, like they they literally take a big risk when they say, "I'm going to go and try and get a degree." And they put themselves on the fringes of poverty and homelessness because they were relying on their student accommodation. So um, we did a big thing, and this was kind of pan university, not just Cambridge, but where we, with the Bottle Trust, about making uh, universities, um, making universities accessible for care experienced people all year round if they've got a spot to study. Um, and I think, I think, I think now. You can, as a care experienced person, spend the whole year in your student accommodation. You'd have to um, look that, but I'm sure Sarah told me you could. So yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, in fact, I'd say, I'd say what was more pertinent to my time at Cambridge was what I did beyond my degree. And I think that's amazing. I know that. Um, I think the student union access officer last year was really passionate about improving access further for care leavers. So it just shows that the work that you did during your time is now being expanded upon, which I think is really amazing. And one thing that's maybe not universal, but that a lot of students who are involved in campaigning have experienced is this sort of pressure or, um, as you said, you have a whole degree to balance with it. So did you have that kind of pressure during your time and how did you actually balance all of these different things that you were doing? Yeah, your time? I really did. I really did. But but again, I, you know, with all the extra bits that I did, it was never like a strategic, scheduled or even planned thing. It was just always responsive. Like, why are they doing that? That's not right. That's not cool. Like, we matter this matters. So I suppose in a sense, because I was, I wasn't like a career student, you know, I wasn't like, I've got my societies down pat. I've got my little gold medal for this that I can present to my potential employer. Like I wasn't that kind of person. I was literally just day by day, you know, you know, kind of navigating Cambridge. But um, I struggled during my second year uh, with the balance, the balancing act. Um, I don't know really. I just learned to prioritise time. I learned to be more organised. I think for a long time, this idea of being organised, I kind of just didn't embrace it. And then I realised that, I, you know, I have no choice. Like if I'm going to be, you know, my best self and do all that I care about in its entirety, I've got to be organised, especially with the like music stuff. Um, so I learned to be organised. I learned to plan my time. I like just basic core skills for life, really. Um, a lot of late nights, I'm sure you've experienced them yourself, <laughs> riding, riding to colleges at 4am to post an essay in a supervisor's pigeonhole. I don't know, I don't know if it's more virtual these days. Of course it is because of lockdown. But at the time it was like, oh yeah, you'd like, I don't know, there'll be some like ACS party and you haven't written your essay, then you'll get home at midnight and then you're like, ah, Red Bull, Red Bull. And then... You write, you write your essay, you've got enough, you, your brain's, um, you've got enough mental energy to make sure the grammar's okay. And then you literally get, jump on your bike, like the little neek that you truly are. And you ride to your um, college, to the college, and you present the essay in the plodge. Uh, and then you ride back and then you sleep until midday. And then you do it all again. <laughs> and that's the thing, that's the, that yeah, the stuff that... Too close. <laughs> that's the stuff that like I'm um, without you know it's this is where I'm like lockdown man and you know COVID because it's like it's those just nuances of Cambridge that you just love and obviously that won't happen if you're doing everything virtually um, so hopefully at least next year at some point we can try and get some normality back who knows though who knows but um, yeah like you'd have weird moments like that where you just like I'm like riding to King's, you know, King's College with an essay in hand about Montesquieu <laughs> and you're presenting an essay and the sun is rising and then you've got, you know, you've got some lecture, 
you know, at midday and you're just like, this is crazy. Like when I was getting suspended at school and getting shunted between four zones, who would have thought that I'd be here on my bike, you know, <laughs> riding through the riding through <laughs> Cambridge. So yeah, um, I, I just learned to be organised and, but a lot of it, a lot of it was blagged, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> Um, and you mentioned the impact of some of the things that you've done since graduating. So it would be great if you could expand on that and um, anything you're particularly proud of. Yeah, well, it's been nine years since I've gra- since graduated. Um, and I'm really, I'm really pleased with where I'm at. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated. Um, I thought it was music. So I was in a band and then my mate, my mate, was at uni. I had, in fact, Patrick Marsh was one of them. Um, I was there <laughs> to audition for the X Factor. They dared me. People dared me to do it at Fitz. And um, wow. I sent him. <laughs> yeah. And I, I went to the chapel at like 10 p.m. after a day of studying in the Ken Olisa Library. Is it called the Ken Olisa Library? Maybe it is, I don't know. Yeah. I know he bought it or something. Oh, it's so good. He paid for it rather, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I went to the chapel and I recorded a YouTube video. I sung Valerie by Amy Winehouse. And I sent I like sent it off to the expert to be like, oh, I've just finished studying. This is my quick audition. Da, 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 da. And then I sang the song. And then it was the last day of May week. I got a call from an extract to producer. Um, this was my last year. Um, at, so my third year and the x producer was like, yeah, we really liked your audition, blah, blah, blah. Do you want to come and do the O2 audition? Now, this was when X Factor was big, right? Like this was 2011. So it was a big show. Not like now. I thought my friend, was, <laughs> I thought I was being pranked by a friend. So I hung up the phone and I, I was, you know, a bit, you know, I was tired after a Mayball party. I think it was Jesus College Mayball that the day after that. And um, so, and then the producer called me back. She said, no, it's really, it's really the X Factor here. I'm really, I've really worked for the X Factor. And then, so days after graduating, I'm at the O2 Arena in front of Kelly Rowland, Talisa, and the, Gabby Barlow, and Louis. They were my judges for that year. And I got through, the, I got through, I got put in a group, which I loved at the time, um, because... The media spot, I was very intense. I had no experience of it. I just, it was very foreign to me. So I loved being in this band and um, we made it through to the live shows. So we were in the final, t- we were in Little Mix's year. So we were in the final 12 of The X Factor. I what? definitely saw you in this one. <laughs> yeah. I loved X Factor at that time. Yeah, yeah we, were li- we were called The Risk and we had a guy called Derry in our group who was quite well known. Because he got a kiss from Kelly Rowland for his first audition, but, um, <laughs> but but you know, so we made it through to the live shows, and you can Google this. We were tipped to win. We were actually tipped to win, and I rem- you can Google it. I just because I don't want to sound gassed, like you can actually. <laughs> My you, can, <laughs> <laughs> you can verify this information, but we made it to the live shows, and then it was after our third performance like on the live. So at this point there were like eight acts left or something because two got voted off every week. I think I can't remember, but I just remember thinking like as well as it was going, I remember thinking legit. I am a care leaver who has just graduated from Cambridge. Like how many mixed race boys become pop stars or boy band members. This was the era of JLS. Don't know if you remember them, but I remember thinking, how many people like me get a Cambridge degree? This is not what I'm, this is not what I'm meant to be doing. I got such a strong conviction of that, and I remember after one of the shows, being in the um, Kelly Rowland's dressing room. Everybody would go to Kelly's dressing room after the shows, and I remember it was all the um, it was all the judges. And then it was like, at this point, Little Mix were called Rhythmics. So we were the only groups left. It was our group in Rhythmics. And then all these other acts like me should be, um, pe- I don't know if you've heard of these people, but um, all, I was in this room. And then every, every week you'd get guest performers. And I think it was Katy Perry 
So we're all just in this room after the show. And I remember thinking, I, I just had a like, I kind of had this weird experience where I just looked at everything and, and as much as I was loving it, because fame is very much overrated, all right? You meet a famous person, you get to know them, you know, that initial thing wears off. They're just a normal person. And so a few weeks into the show, you, you kind of like the hype wears, at least it did for me, I can't speak for other people, the hype wasn't what it was. And I just remember thinking, I could one day change or affect policy. I could become an MP. I could, I could do anything. And whilst, and my, I think it was the, the thought of, I've gone to Cambridge to, um, to get this sense of intellectual credibility that comes with a degree from this university. But then on this show, they were telling me what to say, what to wear, what to do. Every little thing was micromanaged. And I just thought to myself, my potential is greater than this. As great as this show is, my, my long-term potential is greater than this. And for me, longevity is really important. So I quit the show. I quit the show week five. And we were like, we were killing it. We weren't, we were never in the bottom two. We were never like, we were always in the top. We were always like smashing our performances. And so for me, it was like, I have to leave because I know that this is not the trajectory that I'm meant to be on. And sometimes you just got to know yourself. Like you've just got to know yourself and no one can tell you, no one can tell you who you are, right? No one can tell you. And I just knew the same way, the same way that I said, I'm going to apply to Cambridge when it seemed like the dumbest idea because I just was not that guy. The same way I thought to myself, I've got to leave this show. So I left the show and I lit, it was, it was the worst. It was, it was so bad. Like, cause I got so well with the boys in the group. I felt like a snake. I felt like a traitor, but I knew that I had to be authentic and honest. Um, and then I was walking away from such a mega opportunity um, so it was all really tough and it was barren in the months after that. Like there, it wasn't this like, oh, I've quit the show. Now I'm going to become like some hero. Like it was like just dead. There was nothing. I was like, <laughs> what? I, I was broke. I was back to being in my council flat as a care leaver. Like it was so unglamorous. And then in 2012, um, BBC Three asked me to present a documentary about the care system. And at this point, BBC Three was still on TV. Uh, so this was 2012. And um, I, I needed the money, so I did it. And um, it was an hour documentary about, it was kind of a bit of my story, but it was a broader documentary about the care system. And I, you know, when I was at Cambridge, I never thought about Varsity or the tab or like I never, ever thought about, I, I just never, despite being at Cambridge, I never thought, people like me ended up at the BBC. So it wasn't even an option. It wasn't, it was like, the, it was like the consultant, consultancy, law, banking, like, you know, all those graduate fast stream things, like that's all that was presented to me. So I did get a thing with Accenture. I got an interview with Accenture. Yeah, but then, but then, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then obviously X Factor prevailed. But um, so I um, le left the X Factor and then it was only like the following year that I got the BBC Three documentary and I just loved it. It was like the thinker and the performer, like it was a marrying of two very core parts of who, who I am. So that did really well on TV uh, and um, it got really good reviews in the papers. And then the lady who commissioned it said that I should think about journalism. And then fortunately, I got onto a BBC News trainee scheme and I never knew they existed, but I got onto it and I trained up for a year and then halfway through. And what was really interesting, it was meant to be a BBC News online um, traineeship. So how to write for the news website that obviously you have on your the app, like how to write for the website. Mm -hmm. But then they changed it. They really liked me, but they thought the internship wasn't for me. So they made it a broadcast journalism internship so it literally shaped up the whole internship to suit 
my what they thought were my you know kind of strengths and so I, tr- I trained up with the BBC News Channel and then a few months into my internship, um, they were launching the Victoria Derbyshire programme on BBC Two. You heard about that show? Yeah, you have? Okay, good. I was like, that would be awkward if you didn't, and Victoria would hate that. No, no, no. <laughs> I, um, I, I, that show has obviously since been, it got cancelled earlier this year. I don't know if you know about that. But... Um, I joined the launch team for that show as a researcher. And then when Grenfell had, so this was like a couple of years into the show's launch, obviously the Grenfell Tower fire, I just had a really unique ability to get the survivors to speak to us. Um, And all the other programs, all the like white elder, uh, older correspondents, they just couldn't connect with that community. But I just, I was getting all these exclusives as a researcher. So I then, kind of got pushed in front of the camera to prove to report just because they would speak to me they would just like tell you all this like insane stuff about what they saw with the council and all of that and so I went from being a researcher on that program to being like a pan BBC reporter so like I was doing of course for the six and ten o'clock news um breakfast and then obviously Victoria Derbyshire show I got nominated for a Royal Television Society Award, Young Talent of the Year. So I was like shortlisted for that. And then that basically got me a, I got an attachment with Pan BBC News. So I moved from just the Victoria Derbyshire programme to now reporting um, for all the, all the programmes. And then they sent me to Russia for the World Cup. And that was, that was amazing. They sent me to Russia for six weeks as a reporter. And it wasn't just... It was obviously the football, which I loved, but it was also Russia. Like, so you were trying to find really interesting um, social issues. So we reported on like how disabled people were able to get around in the Russian, uh, in the, in the, in the, um, what's it called again? Um, The Metro, because there was just no disabled access. And then we looked at race in Russia. Um, There was just all this really interesting stuff that I was able to do. Plus, go to all the all the games, which was incredible. So, and then after that, I got a job with BBC News, like the pan, you know, organisation. And then um, I got asked to co-host a show for BBC One um, in 2019 about online romance fraud. And so I went from being reported to now presenting a show. And that show did really well. We're recording a second series, ten episodes for BBC One. And I also do a lot now for the one show I've co-hosted that, I present that. And there's some really exciting things kind of, you know, on the horizon. So just from like being a trainee, it's just really, it's gone from like me not even thinking I could do anything in this space to now being uh, like a solid presenter reporter for the BBC. Um, And that's going really well. And yeah, it's it's like wow, this is a bit like nine years in since graduating. If you work hard, kind of follow your passions, stay creative, stay hungry. It's really interesting to see where you can find yourself. Yeah. And of course, um, more recently, we've just watched your documentary Being Black at Cambridge with some yeah. of our friends in our year. So it'd be great to hear about how that idea came about um, and how you found doing the documentary like that as a Cambridge graduate yourself. Yeah, it was a tricky one. I always, I actually didn't want to do it at the start um, because I thought, I think as much as Cambridge is interesting to you if you go there and we can talk about the nuances of being black, I wasn't sure if it would be like interesting to a British audience. And I like to do like, so a big part of my job. So I say I'm a reporter, which I am, but a big part of my job is original journalism. So I get to find my own stories and I get the resources and the space to really do what I genuinely love. But this was a conversation. It was last year when that 91 figure came. Well, you would have been part of that 91 figure. Um, you know, 91 UK black uh, <laughs> undergraduates. So, the, the, you know, it, it was a story... And Stormzy's given it a lot more sort of um, headline worthiness, the whole black admissions issue. And so 
uh, a colleague of mine, a senior colleague of mine, was just like, wouldn't it be great if we could do something on Cambridge, like black people at Cambridge? I was like, oh, no, no, I don't want to do something on black people at Cambridge. Just because I thought it might come across as a bit boring and a bit academic. Mm. And like, you think about the things you like watching, it's not like you don't want, that wouldn't necessarily be interested necessarily. So I thought about it and then um, Wanipa put me in touch with Success, Fabiana and uh, Saren. And, um, and then we just thought, imagine if we could follow them for a year. And we just thought, let's see what we get. You know, it was kind of really open-ended. And then, and I think what we want, why they were really, why they were really interesting is because of regional diversity because obviously success is from Manchester um, and uh, Fabian is from Coventry. And I think that regional sort of representation was really important because I think a lot in the media, the black voice is very London centric and we just wanted to kind of break that. And we wanted to show that actually regional diversity is really important because I didn't see many people like them when I was a student, like just what I would perceive as very, very working class and not trying to sort of present the affectations of a Cambridge person. They were very, very normal. So I thought, okay, because they're super normal, they will speak to people who don't really care about Cambridge. They'll speak to people beyond the Cambridge, you know, demographic, if you like. So that got me excited. And then a, a lingering issue, like a days in Fabiana said that she had had that encounter with the white student who used that racial slur. So I was like, okay, race is going to be an issue in this. And then sound very, very, um, very clever and competent. And she spoke very well about the micro issues and the nuances. Um, and I just thought she'll be really good at educating people. So I think them as individuals really gave what we did a lot of currency beyond just it being my idea or, you know, a BBC boss's idea. And so when we, when we established that, like we were just filming, not knowing what was going to happen, just documenting, getting all this material. And then obviously lockdown happened. And then that was when we were like, we have our sense of jeopardy. We have our sense of, of, um, of drama, really. Like how are they going to get through this year? And so it kind of just, it became much more, um, the more we got into it, the more meaningful it became because we were like, this is a year like no other lockdown, BLM, that, you know, obviously Black Lives Matter protest then break out. like, okay, so this issue is going to become even more topical than it was when we decided to do it. So it's almost like, because I'm, I'm a man of faith, it, was, it felt like divine providence to be very blunt. It just, it was like, you could not have planned this. You just couldn't have planned it, right? Like locked and, and you think about journalism. I, I was like, I was saying to my colleagues, like, who else would have like set out at the start of this year to film something and then have it during lockdown and then have it after lockdown? It's like we're so fort we've got this like material during a year that we may never ever have again, you know? So it just, it, it became, um, it became very special because of everything that happened. And um, yeah, it did really well, by the way. It did really well. Um, it, and it gets four runs. It's getting four more runs on the weekend. But, you know, the bosses at the BBC were really happy because for them, the key priority is underserved audiences and voices that you don't hear often. And obviously you don't get a success of Fabiana and you don't get people like them speaking often on the six o'clock news or the 10 o'clock news as well as on iPlayer. So um, it just kept, you know, getting this momentum that we didn't think it necessarily would have. And I don't know what the response has been in Cambridge. How's it been? It's been great. It's been hard to judge because obviously <laughs> we're not all together. So normally I feel like in normal circumstances, we would have all sat together. Yeah, and we would have done the screening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, it's been great to watch. 100% but it's been great to watch um, 
Yeah. And it's nice to hear the perspective of like, obviously the people who are in it. So we know them they're in our cohort. So yeah. I'm quite close to success and Saren specifically. So, and they yeah. have like loads of good things to say about you. Yeah. And just like oh, amazing you. how- You always want people to like you. <laughs> no, honestly. <laughs> I, I feel like I keep saying stuff in these interviews where it sounds like I'm <laughs> just no. like trying to make you feel better about yourself. But genuinely, they, they, oh. <laughs> they did say that. And I think it's that they yeah. had that platform and they just killed it. Yeah, it was great. They were great ambassadors. Yeah. And I think um, I think it, it was important that they were dark skinned. I think that it was important that they were regional voices. I think it was important that they went to the more traditional colleges because even at Phipps, we're so lucky. Like we, even, even the very, even the very physical space can, can um, affect you. When we think about blackness and how much it can be homogenized and um, just watered down, but I think they represented so much breadth and diversity even within Black British, they were wicked, man. I just thought they were perfect. They were, they were just they were super likable. And, you know, how great that we could present them to have a chat with the Vice Chancellor. Like, I, 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 Vice Chancellor didn't know me when I was at Cambridge. Yeah. yeah. Um, moving on to role models, while you were at Cambridge, was there any, were there any Black students that you looked up to that inspired you, even looking back in hindsight, um, any people in your friendship group that really helps you navigate the experience? Patrick was a wicked friend to have at Fitz. Um, and there was also a lady in the year below me called uh, Simone. I don't know if you've had Simone Sargent. I don't know if she rings a bell. But they were, they, they were just like, honestly, I cannot, like, I cannot describe how, um, how heartwarming it is to have another black person around you sometimes. <laughs> Like, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you guys are so lucky, man. Like, I wish, like, before Patrick came, there were no black, like, there was a black lady, but there were no black brothers in my year, like, like at Phipps. And I was just like, I remember, like, in, in my first year, um, a mate from home had, like, written, like, heavy blood on a Facebook post. And I was like, told him it was just, like, heavy blood. And I had, like, a guy from... <laughs> I was, I, was, I was at Bottom B in my first year. Um, do you know Bottom B? Yeah. And I had... Um, yeah, I'm a <laughs> eesh, Big up. I had a guy... Um, <laughs> <laughs> he came to my room and he said, Ashley, what does heavy blood mean? And I just thought... I think I, um, I, think I said gassed. Oh. Someone got so confused. No, just any word, like any like <laughs> London slang. They're just like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, and it's. I'm not. I'm not demonising people, but it's just like, you can't just like kick back. You know, you're like, you've always got to be mindful of your presentation, and I actually think part of why I do present, the reason why I do present fairly well is because of Cambridge. You learn how to present a version of yourself that's palatable. And that's really important for TV. But um, yeah, that was, that was quite hard for me. So um, to answer your question, just having mates, good mates, and there's a cultural just knowing, a cultural knowing where you don't have to explain yourself or work your butt off to find common ground. I think that's really important. And so friends will, and again, I, I speak about my mates at St. Cat's, um, they were like, I had about, hear this, I had about seven black friends from St. Cats. Seven. Seven. <laughs> you thought I was in London. <laughs> but I remember like, um, uh, like there was this scale um, lady rather called Promise and we'd all descend on her room and then like, um, there, was a, there was a lady called Jenny. Jenny would cook jollof. Jenny would cook jollof, and then um, Jenny would cook jollof. <laughs> oh, is it? And then I'd bring like the little hill punches, <laughs> like we'd all bring like little snacks, and then we'd all just like swamp their room, and we'd just be up until four a.m. or five a.m. just chatting rubbish, and ah, uh, that 
is like you need that man you need you need that synergy that you get from people that you feel comfortable with and just real quick because i know you've got to leave soon but um we're like i think there's six of us six black people in our corridor or five. Yes, so just corridor. to show the difference yeah yeah what? i mean we chose to live together but it's just crazy that that's something that can happen yeah. and that's just amazing. going back to like the cooking thing yeah like, we got to do a christmas event last we had like jollof we had just everything potatoes, everything, everything from imagine. all around cambridge with all the black people yeah <laughs> just like into our kitchen and we ate yeah. <laughs> but yeah so just moving on from that um so this is big change that's happening in cambridge just that little thing of like our social circles yeah. but we wanted to know if there was one thing or several maybe just one thing because of time um that you never thought would change in Cambridge, but now has. That, I mean, hello. <laughs> that, <laughs> you said to me, Ashley John Baptiste, one day, there will be a corridor full of black people. I'd be like, hell no, 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 shut up. It's amazing, it is amazing. Um, but, so that's great. Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, I feel like, I feel like the ACS has, a much more mainstream presence at Cambridge. Um, I, I feel like, I don't know, but I feel like it's respected as a society the same way that the BME society or there was an, I think it, like there was an Indian society and they would have really solid events. The time I was at Cambridge, the ACS was like, you know, everything, like it would be very um, flimsy and not, well, you know, the budget wasn't great. I'd like to think that that's different. I mean, it's hard for you to judge, isn't it? Because um, because of lockdown and coronavirus restrictions. But I know that for a fact because I know um, a mate of mine, William Adwasi. I don't know if you've heard of him. He owns a watch brand called Vite. But he um he yeah, spoke he at the motherland. The, the, oh yeah, well yeah. So he's he's a good mate of mine, and um, he was telling me about that event, and I was like that the kind of scope of that event wouldn't have existed, you know, in my ACS days because we wouldn't have had the budget. I'm like, we did, we, we did like a take me out event. Um, I mean, we just didn't do, it wasn't the same. Like it was more, for me, for me, it was a friendship group. It was fun, but it, it didn't have that air of legitimacy that you probably have now. So I think, I think that's a really positive change. And as you, you know, you've mentioned like the, if there's work going on in terms of access for care leavers, I think that's a really good thing. Things are also clearly like good positive changes. And also you've got the first black no, master yeah, from Jesus. Yeah, we interviewed this. Ah, yeah, brilliant. She went to... I know, I know, she's a G. I mean, Fitz has raised the best people, let's face it. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Come on. Looking into the future now, what are some things that you'd like to see change about Cambridge, if anything? Oh, the legitimate concerns around racism and discrimination, whether that's covert or very explicit. I think it would be great if proper consideration was given to those grievances no matter who they come from, because I certainly know from doing the documentary that sometimes the students felt as if their grievances and their complaints were overlooked. Um, and I say that tentatively because I don't want to accuse the university of anything. But I, if, if there was a culture where there was like not just zero tolerance in sort of rhetoric, but in actual action as well, I think that would be... That's a perfect, like, journalist answer. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you cool. so much. And I just wanted to say quickly, ACS committee this year, and it's just cool to hear like the um, changes in the events and stuff. So yeah, we're doing big things and loads of societies are reaching out to us, which is- Wicked. <laughs> but, Congratulations, man. That's amazing.